So okay, now after the background, you know a little bit about the background and culture of the of the Buddha's time. So we go into the life of the Buddha. <laughs> One of the things people not clear about is actually Buddhism is how old? Eh? Christianity is older, or Buddhism is older, or or Judaism, Hinduism, which is older? I think like for example, some of these um, people get confused. They think maybe Buddhism is quite late, but in actual fact, Buddhism is earlier than. Uh, well, of course, it's earlier than Mahayana Buddhism, much earlier than Vajrayana. Vajrayana came about 700 years uh, after the original teachings of the Buddha. Nah. So Confucianism, around the same time, slightly earlier. Taoism, slightly later. Nah. Christianity, much later, about 500 years later. Judaism, very early. And uh, Brahminism, Hinduism, very early. Nah. So Islam, quite late, about uh, 1,000 years later. And of course, later on, you have these uh, Protestants. And so you can see from here, Buddhism is actually older than Christianity and uh, Islam and uh, some of the other recent uh, developments in religion. So we come to the life of the Buddha. I'm going to split it into several parts. It's so easier for us to understand. Uh, I'm going to break it up into the birth, the early years of the Buddha, his renunciation, the period after his enlightenment. Okay? So... What I'm going to do in this uh, course, uh, I'm not going to teach Sunday school Buddhism or kids Buddhism, as you can see. I'm going to treat all of you here like adults. In other words, I'm not going to teach you all the fairy tales, all the miracles. It's going to be down to earth. Because the mistake a lot of people do is they teach the Buddha's life, all the legends and all that, as fact. Then people get confused. So all this legend, all this, hey, people think it's fact. All this... Uh, Miracles, they think it's, it's fact. So some may be fact, some may be legend, some may be symbolism. So it's important to know the difference rather than everything you just take it face value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to go through the life of the Buddha, but we're going to try to see the difference between the facts, legends and symbolism. Lah, okay. So some of you who, who may already know a bit, this will be helpful. Some of you who may not know much about the life of the Buddha, maybe you can... Uh, uh, if you need to ask questions, by all means, please uh, ask me. Lah. So like I said, knowing all this will allow us to have a better understanding of uh, Buddha and his teachings uh, because then you don't get confused. Okay, first, I'm going to go through what Buddha means. Buddha actually means the awakened one or the enlightened one. The Buddha. Buddha is not a name. It is a, actually a description. It's a title. It is someone, a description of someone who has attained enlightenment, which we call Bodhi la, Pali la. So, by right, when we refer to the Buddha, we don't just say Buddha. It should be the Buddha. In other words, the enlightened one la. So that's the proper way la. If you just say Buddha, 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 technically, that's not correct, but of course we know what it means la. So, Siddhartha Gautama, this is the Buddha's actual name. Siddhartha is the first name, the personal name. According to the stories, it means wish fulfilled. Lah. Because at that time, his parents uh, were not able to have a child for a long time. Then when they had the Buddha, they named him wish fulfilled. That means their wishes were fulfilled to have a child. Gotama is the family name. So his name actually is Siddhartha Gotama. So how come people say Sakyamuni Buddha, Siddhartha Gotama? Actually, what is the difference? People are confused, right? Sakyamuni Buddha means this. Lah. Sakya is the clan name. The Buddha's clan is called the Sakya clan. Also the name of the region. There's a region, the Sakya region, where the Buddha was born. Muni means sage or holy man. <laughs> so Sakya Muni means sage of the Sakya clan. So Sakya Muni Buddha means simply the Buddha of our time, la, Sakyamuni Buddha. La. So now you know the difference why some people call Siddhartha Gautama, some people call Sakyamuni Buddha. Okay, I just want to explain this term called Bodhisattva. In Theravada, Bodhisattva means a being who is bound for enlightenment. Usually it means the person before he attains Buddhahood, before they attain enlightenment, only for the Buddha to be. Mahayana is different. Mahayana, there's so many bodhisattvas. I'm sure like a uh, brother here knows he studied Mahayana. 
many many bodhisattvas. So in uh, Mahayana, the term bodhisattva Bodhisattva has evolved a little bit to mean beings who have postponed their enlightenment to help other beings uh, for the benefit of other beings. Uh. Okay, coming back to uh, the Buddha, we are not sure, uh, nobody is sure exactly which date, but it ranges from 623 BCE to 583 BCE. BCE means before common era, uh, before they used BC before Christ and then AC after Christ. Nowadays we use uh, BCE before common era, CE for after common era. Uh. So the Buddha, or rather the Buddha to be Siddhartha Gautama, was born in Lumbini. This was a place, a small place. It's actually not so much of a kingdom, like it's a protectorate. Uh, according to the Sunday school stories, it's the kingdom, the father was a king and all that, but actually it's more of a principality, a like, protectorate, part of a very much larger kingdom. Like. So he was raised in a town called Kapilabastu. All these are in modern day Nepal. Like. Who has been to India? Three. The rest of you have not been. Okay, good. You can see a photo tour. <laughs> okay. So this is the part where the Buddha operated. This is Lumbini. Nowadays, uh, this part here all is uh, Nepal. Uh. So Kamandu is somewhere there. Lumbini is here. Uh. Okay. So Kapilavasu is slightly further south. Uh. So this, now this is the border. So in order to go to Lumbini, you have to cross from India to go to Lumbini. It's actually quite a long, long way around. They don't allow you to go straight. You have to go one big round. Uh, you see this map quite often because I just want you all to have an idea also of where are all these places. So this is the part where the Buddha operated in the north east of India. Uh, this is the map. Uh. This is a gateway to Lumbini. Actually quite nice. Uh. I was there a few years ago. In fact, I went twice already. Really, really nice place. If those of you who have not gone, you should make an effort to go. This is the called the Mahadevi Temple, where supposedly some uh, red, uh, some imprints of the Buddha are inside. Uh, this is inside the temple. Uh, quite nice. This is Asoka pillar, supposedly marking where the Buddha was born. This is Kapila Vastu, the old, uh, the old stupa. You can still visit nowadays. Okay, so as I mentioned, his father was King Suludana. Actually, king is not also the correct term. Like. He's more of a chief, more of a tribal head. So in, in any case, he's chief of the Sakya clan. His mother was Queen Mahamaya. So they were childless for a long time. And then eventually, they managed to give birth to the Buddha. Like. So on the night uh, Siddhartha was conceived, the queen dreamt that there was a white elephant with six tusks entered her right side and 10 months later the Bodhisattva was born. So these are some of the stories which people tell because you know, if you just tell the bare bones of the story, you really nothing much to tell. So in those olden times, people tend to dress it up, make it more interesting. So this is quite a nice picture, the story, the elephant entering into the side of the mother. So after the queen became pregnant, she left Kapilavastu to go to her father's kingdom. The tradition of that time was that the mother would go back to the father's place to give birth. However, she gave birth on the way to Lumbini. That was halfway in between her Kapilavastu and her father's kingdom. So according to tradition, this is the stories, she gave birth while standing up. She gave birth while standing up with the infant emerging from the side of the body. Well, there's two ways of looking at this. Lah. Some people say, oh, it's Caesarean section. You know, so, you know, you, you, it comes up from the side or whatever they call it. Lah. The other interpretation is that they tell this story because um, they don't want the Buddha to come up from the normal channels. Uh, this one is clean. Uh, I'm sure you all know what I mean. Right? So these are some of the stories they, they tell. We can never be sure. But like I said, I just want to emphasize that these uh, stories may not be wholly accurate. Lah. It's highly likely either maybe a Sicilian section or the Buddha emerged naturally and then they tell these stories to make it more interesting to people. So she died soon after. La. According to the story, she died seven days after she gave birth. Again, people say that this is indicative of Sicilian section because if the mother does not recover, she will die quite soon. La. So then Siddhartha was took after by... Mahamaya's sister Mahapajapati who was also married to the king because at that time the king had many many wives so it's, it's not uncommon 
for the king also to marry the sisters. Lah. So um, this is another part of the story. After birth, directly straight after birth, the infant, and it just came out from birth, started to walk. And then the legends or the stories say, people believe this, lah, that as he walked, one lotus spring up. And then he spoke, he declared, this is his last, last birth. Lah. So this is a very nice picture. The mother standing here is next to a tree, a sal tree, I think. And then these are the devas and all that coming to pay respects at the Buddha's birth. Lah. So then the Buddha takes seven steps. Each step, the lotus spring up. And then he says, this is the birth. Lah. So, is this possible or not? If you just tell people who are not Buddhist or what, you say, ridiculous, or right? How can the infant straight away born out, but not much more than a fetus, do such thing? Of course, people justify, like, say it's a Buddha, sure can, or right? Or? So, but then, can we look deeper into it? Or? Like I said, just the Kalama Sutta. You don't take everything face value, even religious books, Buddhism, all this, all that. You try to look deeper into it. So like I said, I will try to put a more rationalistic picture of the Buddha's life in this course. I'm not going to teach the Sunday school stories and I'm certainly not going to tell you that this is a fact. Likely, this is a legend. This is more towards symbolism. Why do I say that? Because when people tell stories, when they try to dress up the language, for example, government slash taxes, uh, property tax, income tax. So you say, earth-shaking news. Of course the earth don't shake, alright? It's just a figure of speech to denote something which is a great news. So you say, earth-shaking news doesn't mean the earth shake, it's a figure of speech. So likewise, this also can be a figure of speech. Right? Let me give you an example of symbolism. Mahayana Goddess of Mercy, Kuan Yin. All of you familiar, right? Kuan Yin, it's a very nice statue, like, very peaceful. Another picture. How come so many arms, so many heads? Some people say, wow, really ugly, right? How come Kwanim is like that? A thousand arms, heads all over the place, look like some horrible creature. But is this what is is this what the Kwanim is supposed to be picked about? So you look deeper into it. The eleven heads actually symbolizes Kwanim's ability to hear the cries of all suffering beings. The thousand arms symbolizes Kuan Yim's ability to come to the aid of many, many people. So it's not to be taken literally that Kuan Yim has 11 heads and 1,000 arms. But at that time, the ancient times, this is what they depict by such statues and paintings. This is a depiction. They, they don't tell a story. They just show you, okay, this is what Kuan Yim means. All the heads to see and hear all the suffering beings, the thousand arms to reach out to help all these beings. So in fact, all these arms, they're supposed to hold different things, lah, like the sword. Sword not to kill people. Right? Sword means to cut through all your ignorance. Right? right? So the other thing I quite like is this one, <coughs> mirror. One of the hands is supposed to hold a mirror. So what does a mirror mean? The mirror means... Any idea? Sorry? Okay, you say delusion. Mirror means delusion. Anybody guess? What does the mirror mean? Okay. According to what I read, I, I quite like this one. The mirror means, you know, when you people go temple, only out of 10 people, nine people go temple because they're in trouble. <coughs> right now. You're in trouble, you need help, you go and pray, all this, all that. Then, pray, 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 okay, you go back, maybe your problem is solved. Then, get into trouble again. You go temple, pray, pray, please, please, please help me. Either it's Kuan Yim or God or what. Lah. The, reason people usually go temple is because they have problems, even for me. Also, when I first started, oh, I've got problem, this problem, that, ah, please, 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 please help. So the mirror is Kuan Yin saying, look at yourself. Always come here and ask for help. Please. <laughs> look at yourself, go and improve yourself, you know, get lost and then uh, do something to improve yourself. Don't always get yourself into trouble. Lah. So that's what the mirror means. Lah. Okay, that's what I understand. It really could mean delusion. It's possible. But this is one of the explanations. So, this is quite a nice picture of Kuan Yin. Now, there's a modern Kuan Yin, beautiful, no more of this. Um, and all that. Very nice. I quite like this. So, the point I'm trying to make is that this is also symbolism. 
The artist or the painter or what is just trying to say the Buddha before he's given birth has already attained the seven factors of enlightenment. This is a possible explanation. I'm not saying that it is the explanation, but I'm saying it's a possible explanation. So the seven factors of enlightenment, uh, mindfulness, energy, equanimity, all the seven factors. So that means before the Buddha is enlightened, he must already have the seven factors of enlightenment. So this is just simply saying that the Buddha already has the seven factors of enlightenment in this drawing that's all right, right? So not necessarily this has to be taken literally. No. That, that's just my point. No. So like I said, it may be a later addition of the story to symbolically mean symbolically mean that the Bodhisattva, the Buddha to be, has already successfully cultivated the seven factors of enlightenment in his past lives. So after the Buddha, or after Siddhartha was born, there was this uh, ceremony, la, naming ceremony. So the father asked some of these holy people to come for the celebrations. So the first one is this ascetic called Asita. So he predicted that the infant would be a great spiritual teacher. Shortly after that, the father invited eight holy men to the naming ceremony. At that time, I, I guess when they named the infant, they have a ceremony. La. So these holy men, on examining the infant, seven of them predicted he would be either a world monarch, a world ruler, or he would be a Buddha. Only one of them declared that he would be a Buddha. La. The reason they say is because his hair turned to the right. So the last, the youngest of these uh, holy people say he would only be a Buddha. The rest said he would be either be a world monarch or a Buddha. This is important because, according to the stories, King Shir wanted his son to be a monarch, right? A powerful ruler, riches, this kingdom, that kingdom. Instead of a Buddha, but Buddha is just a spiritual teacher. I think even nowadays, parents sure prefer their children to be rich in business, successful, so on and so forth. Very few people, very few parents want their children to follow the spiritual path. So naturally, the king wanted his son to be a monarch, a king instead of a Buddha. So therefore, according to the stories, the king tried to protect the Buddha from the realities of life. He gave him a luxurious life. He gave him one palace for the hot season, one palace for the cold season, one palace for the rainy season. In India, no four seasons, and don't, don't have spring, summer, autumn, winter. It's hot, cold, and rainy, la, that's all. La. So one palace for one season. Then uh, he married his cousin at the age of 16, and had a luxurious life in the three palaces. La. So the father wanted to give him the best of everything, to want him to get into this spiritual uh, path. So according to the stories, according to the legends, old and sick, not allowed to be seen by the prince. They say even in the compound, uh, got dead leaf, ah, they must faster pick up so the Buddha cannot see got dead things, got old things, all that. You, you understand what I mean? Uh? So the, the Buddha's father wanted to protect him from all these things. Uh. So he's afraid that the Buddha will see all these harsh realities of life and then to renounce the world and take the spiritual path. So, but despite the best efforts of the father to keep away the sick, old and dying, the prince was shown these sights by the devas. Devas are the heavenly beings. La. So you ask yourself this question. Is it feasible for the father to keep away all this sick, old and dying? La? Number one, the father himself grow old. The people around him also grow old. So some of the Sunday school stories they tell you, oh, because the father dyed his hair, they put makeup, all this, all that, to fool the Buddha. La. Because they come up with all, all these kind of stories that the father is able to fool the, 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 the Buddha, that nobody grows old, nobody gets sick, nobody dies. La. But honestly, it's, it's quite far-fetched. I'm sure the Buddha isn't that. La, la, la. So the story is that the Buddha went into the town, he saw this old man, he went into the town, saw this sick man, went into the town, saw this uh, dead man, and then eventually saw a uh, ascetic, and then after that he decided to renounce. And then furthermore, when he renounced at time, he ran away in the night. La. So nobody woke up. Why did 
people they didn't wake up. So the story is because the devas suppress the noise so that no one would be awake and then he can leave the palace. So these are all these um, stories which are told, uh, part of the legends. Uh. It's uh, quite a nice picture. All the different sites the Buddha saw. Uh. But I think it's more likely that the prince thought about this, he contemplated this by himself without seeing all these sites. Uh. He may have seen these sites on and off, but it's more likely that as an intelligent person, maybe a slightly spiritual, intellectual person, he would think about these things, which is quite natural. Uh. And like I said just now, this was in an age where leaving home on spiritual quest was part or is an established part of Indian culture. There's a reason why, just now I went through with you all about this Brahmin Ramanas. So you can understand that it's nothing unusual for the Buddha to leave home. You don't need to come up with all these fantastic stories why the Buddha leave home, he sneak away and all this all that. It's already part of the culture. So the prince renouncing may have been painful, but it's not uncommon. Why do I say this? That is legends. Because the suttas themselves say well, this sutta describes the Buddhas, the Buddha leaving home in his own words. So the, the, the sutta says this, this is what the Buddha says about himself. So he left home still a young black haired man endowed with youth in the first stages of his life. This is the important part. He left home in full view of his parents, Ma, while his parents not willing to let him go, were crying with tears streaming down their faces. So this obviously shows that those legends are incorrect, that the Buddha left home in the middle of the night, so on and so forth, that he actually left home in full view of his parents. And like I said, this is part of the culture at that time. The Buddha was one of these spiritual seekers. It's painful, but it's not uncommon. So he shaved off his hair and beard, put on the robe, and went from the home life into the homeless life as one of those spiritual seekers, the Sramanasa. So do you get what I'm saying? No? In other words, don't just take a face value all these legend stories and all that. Look deeper into it. You can find evidence of the correct stories in the suttas. No? So he left his wife and son, then began a life of spiritual wandering to seek the truth of existence. So leaving his wife and infant son, he began a life of spiritual wandering to seek the truth of existence and the way out of suffering, the way out of samsara, similar to many of the spiritual seekers at that time. He became one of the sramanas, the wandering ascetics, common in it during that period of time, that's all. So this is the first part. I went through the birth and early life. So hopefully this will give you a clearer picture of the life of the Buddha.